And as I say, for those of you that are just joining us, if you'd like to say hello, you can um, open up the chat window down at the bottom of the screen, just a little speech bubble, um, and do say hello and let us know where you're joining us from this morning. It's always nice to see. I know uh, we have a, a mixture of colleagues from different organisations across the Northwest joining us, so it's always good to see who, who else is in the room with us. Um, and just a bit of Zoom etiquette, um, as you join, um, you, you will be on mute. Um, and quite often, I think it, it um, automatically turns your camera off. So uh, if you do want to be, be seen, um, then you can just click on the little video recorder symbol uh, down in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and that'll start your video. So start your camera so you can see and we can see you. So please uh, feel free to do that if, uh, if you are, uh, if you're camera ready this morning um, and uh, what we would ask you to do um, as we go through the session is quite interactive. So if you've got any questions or you want to come on um, and, and put some um, questions to our speakers this morning, it, uh, it's always nice if you are, if you are putting a question um, that you put your camera on, that would be great. Um, but otherwise, um, you don't necessarily have to have it on, but, uh, but please feel free to do that. OK, I'm just going to check with colleagues. I think we're probably good to go and um, just make sure everybody's in that needs to be in. Yep. OK, I think we'll get underway then. So good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this latest in our series of collaborative masterclasses across the Northwest. Uh, today's theme is leading for social justice and equality. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the collaborative uh, Northwest to this session. My name's Sharon Senior, and I'm the executive director at Northwest Employers. So we're one of the partner organizations that supports the collaborative series. Um, so we're delighted to welcome you here th this morning. Um, in terms of the, the topic for today, so it's, it's all around leading for social justice and equality. And we're, we're going to be looking today at how we can put diversity, equality and inclusion practice at the heart of what we do to make our workplaces more inclusive. So it's a topic that we know will be of um, real interest to, to, to everybody. Uh, and the, 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 the way that we've um, put the session together today is designed to be really interactive so you'll be able to really get involved. So a little bit of um, housekeeping and introduction to the collaborative. If you haven't joined these master classes before. Um, we've been going for a number of years now and we're a, a really strong partnership that's made up of six partner organisations. You might have seen a little bit more of us on the, on the opening slides, but um, if not, just a, a reminder of who's involved um, and who's brought you the masterclass today. So we've got um, partnership with Mersey Internal Audit Agency, um, Advancing Quality Alliance, so ACWA, the NHS Northwest Leadership Academy, um, myself at Northwest Employers, Northwest Association of Directors of Adult Social Care, so Northwest ADAS, and the Innovation Agency Northwest. Um, so across um, the, the six of us, we represent a number of different health and um, care local government organisations across the Northwest. And by working together, it brings our unique specialisms together, but also gives us the opportunity to have kind of greater buy-in power and get some really great expert speakers in and really develop that cross-sector knowledge um, for you as leaders across the Northwest. So we're really proud to be um, one of the partners and, and we've, we've done some great work over the last couple of years to, um, to develop the programme. So if you've been on one of our sessions before, welcome back. And if you haven't, where have you been? Um, so hopefully this will We'll give you a real good uh, taster of the kind of things that we can do as a collaborative so I really encourage you to get involved um, and uh, you know, really make the most of the session this morning. So in terms of the agenda and as I say some of the housekeeping we're going to run till um, about 12 o'clock this morning. Now when you look at the agenda we haven't factored in um, a natural break as such um, but what we will do is you know obviously at any point in in the morning if you want a, a quick comfort break or need to get a, um, a brew or anything and keep your energy levels um, up then by all means do so but there's no kind of structured break uh, but there will be opportunity for you to just stretch your legs and uh, and get, get away from the screen for a short while. So um, I'm really pleased uh, this morning that we've got two great speakers um, that are joining us for the session um, and I'll, I'll do some intros uh, in a moment but one of the things that I think is really important is that um, you're not uh, you've not joined us this morning to be talked at um, so you will find that the session is really interactive there's some opportunities for group discussions we've got video and um, there's some interaction as well so we want to make it really engaging uh, and encourage you to to enjoy the session and get the most out of it. Um, as I said at the start, uh, your microphones will be off, um, but please, uh, if you do want to get involved and you've got any questions or you want to get involved in the chat, then please um, flag that up 
pop your hand up or pop that in the chat and, and the team will be monitoring um, the chat box as well uh, and myself so we'll make sure that we capture any of your questions so that uh, nothing gets missed and uh, so we've got the session being recorded and um, so as always with these sessions there'll be a link sent to you and made available after the session along with the slides um, and any resources that we've used or that we've referenced in the session so that you've got that as a source of reference um, after this morning uh, so without further ado I shall get us underway and I'm really delighted to welcome this morning um, as I say we've got two two um, guest facilitators that will be joining us and the first of, of those is Gunan Adamu now some of you um, if you're a big Eurovision fan you might have come across Gunan um, of late because Gunan is an experienced journalist and broadcaster and presenter and has done some um, loads of work for BBC Radio Merseyside and at the moment um, and this, this isn't necessarily her expertise that she's bringing to the session this morning but she's very busy with the launch of the Eurovision in Liverpool so I'm sure she'll share some snippets of that with you but actually in terms of um, what Gunan brings to the session this morning. She's done some great work, as I say, around uh, working for the BBC. She's done some international work training journalists across Africa and Asia. Um, and in addition to her broadcasting experience. Gunan is also an entrepreneur and community leader and she's led a number of different initiatives and projects that promote diversity um, across the media and, and, and as I say has done some great work internationally as well. She's also um, a founder and the CEO of iWoman Media Limited and iWoman Academy Community Interest Company um, which is a peer-to-peer -peer organization that's been set up by women with the aim of empowering, entertaining and inspiring women across the world. So she's got some great experience that she's going to share and bring to the session this morning and in addition to that um, she's Gunan sits on several boards um, and leads on a number of innovative projects that address equality diversity and inclusion across a range of different sectors so some fabulous experience um, and you'll see uh, when Gunan joins us um, in, a, in a moment that her style is really interactive and um, really energetic uh, so you won't be it's not one of those sessions where you can just sit back and listen to it actually there's she's going to get you to do some work and get some uh, some real good discussions going and i think that's the really important part of this session with this theme what we want to do this morning is create the environment where we can have a safe space to have some really productive and constructive conversations around the things that we can do that will really make a difference so without further ado and i have forgotten gunana i do apologize in addition to all of that you're also um a single mum to a beautiful young boy aren't you so uh, so in your spare time when whatever little of it is when you're not doing the Eurovision um, and actually what I think was really lovely when you when you shared that with us you said actually your son reminds you of why you do what you do and I thought that's a fab fabulous way um, of just introducing you this morning so welcome to the session welcome to the collaborative Thank masterclass you. and I shall hand over to you to take us through um, the first part of this morning thank you Gunan. Oh, thank you so much Sharon thank you so yeah so Apologies, because as time goes along, I've had coffee, so I can't be quite hyper. <laughs> um, but also, um, what, one thing I didn't share as well was that um, I did a massive pro um, project, a European project called Breaking Barriers, that was looking, um, was working with the European Broadcast Union, who, um, who look after, well, who have Eurovision. And it was looking at um, equality, equity, diversity, um, best practices across Europe, including Australia. And um, so, if you want, so hopefully, once we get get through this, if you have any questions around, you know, what you think you should be doing or could be doing, I can share some examples. Um, but through that project, I definitely say the the leader, um, when it came to diversity initiatives, um was Germany, which is funny enough. So yeah, but I can share a little bit more about that later on. So this is just a quick background and I, I hope you've read it real quick because we haven't got that much time because I can talk a lot. And um, can we go to the next slide, please? So yes, yeah, so we've got a slide all coming up um, and this is also to do with rate your confidence and interest in EDNI. And I want you to be as honest as possible because the best way for me to share examples and to support your journey into doing more or trying to do more um, when it comes to EDI is through honesty. And this is a very safe space as well. So I know it's being recorded, um, but I always like to create a space of non non 
non-judgmental um, and there's no stupid questions either we are all in different parts of the UK um, and have different experiences that we bring forward so please be um, you know be honest in terms of your confidence and interest when it comes to EDNA. so yeah can we get this slide that will please so yes, you can join um, either slido.com, um, scan the QR code, or you can use hashtag, oh yeah, hashtag two, is it, can't even say it now. So yes, use the hashtag 2250214 to, um, to do the, the survey. So yeah, I might give it a go actually. I think that's a really good point, actually, Gunan. People are just pop popping in the chat. There's a difference, perhaps, between the confidence and interest scores. I like that. Fantastic. It's such a good question as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think we've had most people just looking. I think quite a lot have responded now. Yeah. I like Great. that. Should we move on? Yes, please. And what are some of the challenges? So that kind of leads on to, you know, your confidence as well. So what are some of the challenges you have experienced in encouraging? Um, oh, let's go back. Can we go back to the slide though? There you go. Sorry, I didn't know what happened there. <laughs> so yeah, what are some of the challenges you have experienced in encouraging greater EDNI in your workplace? Our systems, okay. Time to develop. Lack of leadership, uh, poor leadership, pressures, lack of knowledge. Uh, it's so interesting. Um, when I was doing the the European Broadcast Union project, a lot that was a big one. So a lot of the leaders knew that for anything to work, they had to they had to show commitment. Our individual discomfort, most effective approaches. Okay, Brexit and polarization, fear of change vulnerability, saying the wrong thing. So we're going to be touching on definitions as well. Knowing what has impact. So a lot of that would be, so in terms of knowing what has impact, that would be um, communication and sometimes assumptions that we make. I, I know so. I know a lot of people are quite scared nowadays of having those conversations and those what they deem to be awkward conversations. Um, so that's an interest, vulnerability. Oh, I love that. Christina, will this save for us? Yeah, should do Manar, we should have a recording with Manar. Sorry, Gunan, <laughs> but Manar, if you're on standby, can you take a screen grab, please, if that's possible? Thank you. Using the wrong words, time lack of understanding, colleagues' time. Let me know when you're ready wow. to move yeah, on. Yeah, can we move on to the next question? That's fantastic. Oh, one participant, okay. How comfortable are you with talking about your background? So this is a really interesting one. Um, so when I was growing up, obviously you can tell um, I'm, I'm a scouser 
I'm a Nigerian scouser. Um, but coming to, we moved to Liverpool. So I was born in Nigeria and we came to Liverpool in 1984. My mum was born in London and she, her family moved back to Liverpool. So we always say we did a bit of a swap. And um, so coming to Liverpool and Liverpool's history um, with the black community, growing up, Liverpool is a very strong working class community. Now, I don't come from a working class background. You know, my dad worked for the United Nations. My granddad um, was a journalist. Um, you know, so I didn't come from a working class background. You know, so my upbringing was completely different. But actually, I went to comprehensive schools, both primary um, and secondary. And for years, I never, ever told anyone in my school that my dad was a doctor and my background because I thought oh god they'll make fun of me and it meant it meant I didn't fit in into what was stereotypical black in in Merseyside so it took me a very long time and even when I got into the BBC there was this notion that you know because I came from Liverpool and I had a Scouse accent I was working class um I was, I probably didn't go to university. I was the first to go to university in my family. Um, everyone in my family's gone to university. Plus they've got PhDs. I've got no PhD. Um, so it was all these assumptions that actually made me uncomfortable. And I think, and I, and I shared that story because um, one of the things that we don't really talk about is social mobility in, in all its forms. So yeah, it took me a long time to really be comfortable openly talking about um, my family background and who I am, um, because it, it felt like um, I didn't have that real working class struggle, you know, which is what they wanted me to have. Um, so yeah, so it's really interesting. Like that 47% comfortable or extremely comfortable, a little uneasy very very uncomfortable interesting so yeah if you would have asked me this maybe 15 years ago I probably would have said a little uneasy um to being open about my my background for the opposite reasons um so yeah really interesting yeah next slide fantastic Yep, yeah, keep going. <laughs> so this is a fantastic video. So please do have your pen and paper ready and feel free to, because there's so many things that Janet's going to say that um, might trigger some, some things in your head. So put some, make sure you, you add your, um, your comments in the chat as well. Yeah, good to go. I love that video and it was it was a little it was about 10 minutes long and obviously you know it's um it's American but there's bits in there that I'm sure you could have picked out from um and yeah a lot of oh next slide so it brings me on to do we have Sharon how am I, how am I doing for time you're you're okay yep yeah. okay yep so, let's go fantastic so the circle of trust um so these are the four, what, six questions. So what, who do you go to when you need someone to trust with a problem at work, someone to pick up a piece of work or someone to bounce ideas off? Um, another one is who do you socialize with? What is the makeup of your direct reports? Um, so your employees, um, um, who have you promoted recently? So these are like the leadership and supervisors. Who have you recruited and how might you diversify your circle of trust? Um, so have five minutes say two to five minutes to, to 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 answer those questions you can write them in your piece of paper free um can't even say feel free to put it in the chat as well um and i'll just be i'll just keep on talking so for me um i've 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 stolen a lot of um a lot of friends <laughs> and mentors. So I've got mentors that don't even know they're my mentors. Um, so I've got a friend who is non-binary and um, and trans as well. And whenever there's anything that's in the news um, in regards to LGBTQ plus or um, tra the trans community, um, I always go to them because I want to know what they're thinking and how they feel about what, how we as the media are, you know, are, are 
or can actually report on certain stories. And for me, it's about not getting things wrong. And I can literally ask them any kind of question. And I feel safe to ask them those questions. And equally to them, they feel safe to ask me certain questions as well. So we like we have lunch uh, maybe once a, once a month. But if there's anything that we need to talk about, we are on the phone to each other. Um, I also have mentors who are white men, you know, in their 60s in the business world. Um, and I'm, I'm always asking questions around entrepreneurship, business. Are they speaking a different language to me? Why isn't certain things going my direction? If I've, if I've put together uh, a proposal, you know, I take it to them to have a little look over. So it's looking at what's your, what does your circle of trust look like? Um, and how do you, how do you go, you know, who do you go for, for guidance or ideas? So yeah, have a little think about that, but feel free to also write the questions down, but we'll probably share this with you at the end as well, because I think it's a really interesting um, conversation to have with, with friends, with colleagues, um, and, and maybe with mentors and coaches as well. And really make you think about what your, what your circle of trust looks like. Um, I think it's gotten a little bit worse with social media because we are in our silos, our little incubators. Um, and the algorithm always shows comments that fit in with your way of thinking. So we need to expand that a little bit. Does anyone have any questions as I'm talking and looking at the circle of trust? Let's go to the next slide, please, Christina. So off the back of those questions, um, I want you to think about their characteristics. So I put in gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, age, education level is another big one, um, nationality, ableness, native language, accents. Um, and I, I we well, say so I put in accents because I know when I joined the BBC, um, a lot of fun was made on, you know, me being Scouse. And there was always those jokes on, oh, um, hide your wallets. Um, do I still have my my uh, my car my car wheels or my tires? You know, it was really so see, so um deprivation, I've put that uh doo -doo -doo -doo. did I put in social mobility? I haven't put social mobility, but that's um I would put that with, I don't know whether it might be a good way of putting that with education level, um, but I think deprivation is a really good one. The reason why I put education level as well is because, again, I'm using, using the BBC as an example. There's a lot of people who do have um, degrees, who have masters, who have, you know, PhD um, in, me, in certain media topics. And there was always, you know, this thing around, you know, do you need, do you need to have a degree? Do you need to, what kind of qualifications do you need to, to join um, a co um, a co corporation as the, as the BBC? And I used to think, oh, from my point of thinking, even though I went in with a degree, I learned more on the job than I did in my degree. So I used to say to people, actually, I don't think you need it, but actually when I've moved around the BBC, there's a lot of senior leaders that feel that, They've got more respect for people who do have degrees. So Rahana says, I'm okay to read this out. I do think we need to be mindful that we don't ask minoritized groups to share their lived experience solely for our own education, self-education. Um, yeah, self-education, I think, is so important without asking people to re-traumatize themselves by going through experiences. I know when the George Floyd murder happened, I did not want to speak to others about it and it hit me hard. So whilst reflecting, it's important to see who is in our circle of trust. And I think we need to be mindful and sensitive of asking more of minoritized groups, which will require additional emotional labor on their part. I totally, totally, totally agree. Um, but also I think for me, my circle of trust is people who know me very well and equally people who I know very well. I know when George Floyd happened, um there were people that I, I hadn't spoken to in in like 10 years reaching out to me and I was thinking well we haven't got that kind of relationship for you to be asking me that and it is that kind of you know reliving traumatic experience and being a mother of of a black little boy you know um young son it's 
I didn't want to think about that. And equally now with Tyree Nichols, what's happened? Um, I'm fortunate that I haven't had anyone coming to me, you know, because we've, we've had those conversations within the workplace about, you know, asking certain members of staff how they feel because it is traumatic. This, you know, what's gone on is, is not surprising for a lot of us in the black community. Uh, racism is not new to us. Levels of racism is not new to us. So yeah, I totally agree with that, Rahana. Totally agree. Can we move forward, please? And this is a quick one because we've got, um, we need to have a break in a, in a little bit. So one of the questions that I've been asked a lot is how do we spot diversity trends? A lot of it is based around conversation, um, but also research as well. So we, one of the, um, when we did the poll, so I mentioned about systems and system. So this is another one about systematic change uh, or systemic change. Um, you know, looking at the media, looking at conversations, and hopefully if you've got a diverse group, it's listening to conversations, you know, being able to un understand your workforce a little bit more. Um, but from top to bottom as well. I know when I first started at the BBC, I was only 25. Um, and rarely did my voice ever get heard. And what they missed out on was a lot of my experience, um, even, you know, generational experience as well. I come a family that's very political. You know, my granddad was a journalist and wrote books um, for, for Oxford and Cambridge University around Africa and Nigeria. You know, my dad worked for United Nations. He traveled all over the world. So I had, you know, so much of all this information in my head um, that they just completely missed out because they just saw me as a junior member of staff, um, you know, with preconceived ideas that maybe I hadn't gone to university um, so yeah, but and this is a really big one. Looking beyond tokenism, I don't want to be, you know, from the from a BBC perspective, I stopped doing interviews for them when it came to um, you know, being black. I don't want to talk about being black. Oh, you know, there's more to me on that. I play chess, you know, I'm a big Marvel fan, like <laughs> you know, I watch Univision, I'm very I'm full of cheese. I used to listen to um Metallica and Guns N' Roses when I was growing up. My family listened to country music, you know, so it's all these things of just because I'm a black woman doesn't mean I tick all these, you know, stereotypical black boxes, you know, so there's so many different questions that I should be getting asked, but nobody knew that because no one took the time out to talk to me and find out more about me. Um, so yeah, so we'll, again, we'll send, we'll send this over to you. Um, and I've put in multi-generational workforce and um, the pension age now has increased, is, is increasing to 68. Um, my auntie refused to retire until she was 72, you know, so because she loved her job and she still had all this experience. So being able to, to look at age as well. Um, and I realized in when I did the project in Europe, there was age was a big thing for them. Um, and I realized in the UK, age isn't a very big thing that we talk about over here um, and social mobility as well. Um, so, yeah, so we can talk about that later on. Um, Sharon, how much time do I have? I think if um, a few more minutes just to whiz through the, those next bits, I think, and then we'll move on to the breakout. So, yeah, a couple of minutes just to go through the next slides. That'd be great. So let's move on to the next slide. So this is an interesting one. Um, definitions and diversity glossary. So I know a lot of people, the reason why um, they don't want to talk about EDI is because they're scared of saying the wrong things. Now, language is something that constantly evolves. And I'm a big fan of Shakespeare. And he created, I think, something like, you know, thousands of different words that we use today. Um, so language is something that we, that continu continuously um, changes. But can we click on the first one real quick? And I'll share, we'll share this with you as well. Hopefully it'll open up. If not, we're more than happy to share that. Uh, I'll, I'll share it in a minute, sorry. Fab. Um, next slide. I think the link has just blocked it, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh God, 
Okay, bye. Forward. Any questions for any, for any, well, any questions so far? I like it when, no, I don't like it. I was going to say, I like it when it's, when it's, um, when it's silent. That means everyone's thinking about it. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, new term. It's not even a new term. It's just like it's making headlines right now. Um, global majority and global ethnic majority. Um, so have a quick read. Um, thank you, Denise. Yeah, have a quick read of this. Um, I was in a workshop and we spent an hour actually disseminating and talking about global majority and global ethnic majority and what that meant. Um, and as I put there, you know, it, 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 it has challenged, it has been challenged on several fronts um, and it does not include white ethnic groups that are cultural minorities and white majority societies such as Irish Jews, and travellers in the United Kingdom, and is also seen as using majority out of context and thereby distorting language. Um, I don't know how I don't, it's a, it's a funny one because I don't know how I feel about this. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about it because I wasn't a fan of Bane either. Um, I feel sometimes I'm I'm happy for the whole thing just to be spelt out. You know, African, um, Caribbean, Indian. Pakistan, like for me, it's I do I think Tim sometimes it's just making things just shortening what people want to say. However, it does, you know, it it builds this concept that we are all one, and even within Africa, we're not one. Um, you know, we're not a monolith. So it's it's interesting when we talk about global majority and global ethnic majority. So it's but like I say, you know, it's it's best to ask questions. Um rather than make assumptions but also if looking at the media we're always constantly changing terminology as well because we are constantly having these conversations as journalists and um, within the organizations and um, because we don't want to offend anyone um but but at the same time we don't want to group ev um everyone together as well so yeah can we move forward please And we'll end on this. Um, to BAME or not to BAME. Well, let me see. Bianca has got. We should create a space where people feel safe to self-identify without being boxed by others. You know what, Bianca? That is what we would love. Um, I definitely think ethnic minority is a very minimized and broad brush term, as you say, going on, assuming homogeny and in so doing loosen the richness of stories and experience. Totally. And I think as well, you know. I said the terminology is just to, when it comes to surveys and reports, I think I do believe it's a lazy way of grouping people together. I really do. Um, but I think we need, we could do better. And it's a conversation that we have to continuously have. Are we going into the breakout rooms? Not just yet. Um, I don't know. That's just appeared on, on screen. I don't know if other people can see that as well. Can we have, because I know we've got quite a bit, but I'm more than happy to have, yeah, to go into our, go move forward with our breakout space. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good, good move. So pre-work discussion, I know I sent um, a lot of you, well, we, you all got this, um, the BuzzFeed link to white privilege. Um, if you haven't done it, it's not a problem because it's a question as well, because during, you know, during the time when we had, um, you know, Black Lives Matter was prominent. And when I say prominent, it was um, catapulted into the media during George Floyd. A lot of people I know who got offended by the word white privilege. So I'll be interested to know how you feel about that. So we are going to go into breakout spaces um, and we'll also think, talk about um, the results as well. So yeah, happy to go into the breakout spaces. Welcome back, everyone. We'll just uh, make sure everyone's back from the breakout rooms and then we'll do a bit of a, a quick debrief on what, what you've uh, shared. This meeting is being recorded. 
I did not want to stop talking. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was I know that I would have enjoyed every single breakout room, but the conversations that we had in our room, oh, it was fantastic. And I put did you see it in the chat? Oh no, it's gone now. But what Hannah in our group said a really strong, it was a strong statement for me. And it was when I stopped feeling uncomfortable, I started getting more curious. And it's recognizing that privilege is not a bad word. I've got privilege, we've all got privileges. But when we look at privilege as a negative, we become this kind of, well, I had a harder than you, rather than actually the position I stand in right now is a position of privilege that allows me to support other people. You know, so we had, honestly, I didn't want to leave that. I didn't want to leave it. <laughs> so um, would it be helpful um, just if, if um, people from each of the rooms, if we've, we've just got a few minutes um, just to hear some of those snippets actually. So, um, so if anybody is willing to um, share some feedback from each of the rooms or if you want to pop it in the chat it'd just be really helpful because um i think with with those smaller conversations it's great because you can you know you can get a bit more into it can't you but then actually as a group we miss perhaps miss out on some of those nuggets so if, if there are any key um things that emerge from your conversation that you're happy to share collectively that would be really helpful um just over the next few minutes so does anybody from each of the groups want to want to share or pop something in the chat juliet thank you Hi, just Hi. my camera. Hi. Um, yeah, so we had a really interesting chat, and as, as ever, it always just goes really, really quickly. Um, I think you know one of the things that we talked about early on was the the assessment and the that was done. And I really, I'll confess, I didn't do it, but a lot of these um, on these online tools are, are very American, and and so you know there was a bit of discussion about well that kind of put me off doing it and yada yada, but then. I think that speaks volumes in itself that we don't have the you know many British uh, cultural tools that we're using to do these kind of large-scale assessments or offer those um, opportunities to raise awareness and so I think that maybe that was an interesting point um, and then we just talked a lot about our own kind of um, you know the sort of the the whole issue of prejudice not just being about race but also being about you know cross-sector deprivation you know um classes etc etc and then you know what is kind of different about those things and where's where's the intersection between those things as well and how do we i think what we came up with as well is just having that again feeling i personally talking feeling quite vulnerable when you start talking about these things because you don't want to get it wrong you don't want to say the wrong thing you don't want to offend which then kind of drives you to just keep your mouth shut rather than having that you know opening up that discourse about it great thank you Juliet sorry Ganan were you going to come in then now I was just going to say, um, Rohana said that, um, Rohana said as well about what we do with our privilege is so important. Um, and, you know, I get what Juliet is saying around, you know, looking at um, a lot of the tools that we sometimes use are very American. Um, but for me, it's, it's looking at the questions and saying, what does that mean? What does privilege mean? Um, and not, as Hannah said, not feeling uncomfortable. You know, you've got to be able to be comfortable with being uncomfortable when we talk about ED and I, because that's the if when we feel uncomfortable, then there's something that triggers us to feel uncomfortable, and then we have to look at look into ourselves as to why we feel uncomfortable about it. About it, but like Hannah said, once she stopped feeling uncomfortable, she got curious, which meant she started doing her own research. She starts looking at different opportunities. So I think it's about how do we develop ourselves and not feel uncomfortable about our saying, you know, yeah, I do have privilege. It's not about, you know, I was, you know, well, I was raised in a, in a home when, you know, we we didn't have two slices of bread. So my my I can't be privileged, but actually in the situation that you are in right now, you are privileged. We all have privileges. There's, it's very rare that you can say nobody has a privilege. When you look at the quiz, there's so many different questions in that, that actually we all have privileges. And what do we do with those privileges? Okay, 
Great, thank you. Does anybody, anybody else want to share any snippets from, from your group conversations? Or as I say, I encourage you to pop it in the chat if there's, there's anything that you think would be useful for, for others. No, nothing at the moment. No, okay, that and that's fine. Thank you. And and what I'm going to do is just um, pause there for um, a moment. And thank you, Gunan, for your input so far. But I know we're going to come back to you and talk about psychological safety. Uh, so we'll, we'll follow on and, and, and build on the conversation that we've had so far. So thank you so much for for your input this morning and getting us going and and really helping us to start thinking about this and exploring it uh, in in more detail. And as I say, we'll we'll come back to you shortly. Um, but now what I'd like to do. We're going to move on and I'm going to introduce our second guest facilitator for this morning. I'm delighted to welcome Jade Eco Bichon Gray, who is the founder of Mindset Matters UK. And Jade, um, Jade describes herself as, as being on a mission. Hi, Jade. Nice to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us. And Jade, you describe yourself Hello. as being on a mission to empower businesses um, to look at workplace wellness uh, and equality, diversity and inclusion through that social lens. And I think there's something really important about understanding that connection um, and how you can best use that you know, better connections for an improved workplace and, and you know kind of improved world really so so really delighted to welcome you and I think in terms of what you bring to to the session this morning you've got over a decade of um, experience working across industries you bring that academic insight to really start to help us consider how our own organizations can create more fresh and innovative approaches to workplace well-being and equality diversity and inclusion so really looking forward to hearing from you so a good good um, morning and very warm welcome to the masterclass. and jade i'll hand over to you thank you Thank you so much. What an incredible introduction. No pressure at all. <laughs> so I'm going to now try and do the tech part of this and share my screen with everyone and hope that this works. Um, so can you let me know if I am in full screen mode? You are now. Yes, that's it. Fabulous. Perfect. Um, so um, Hello everyone, my name is Jade Akobajon Gray. Um, I am the founder of Mindset Matters UK, which is a social wellness and diversity and inclusion consultancy. Um, today I'm going to be talking you through a strategic approach to DNI. Um, and the reason that I'm so passionate about having this conversation is because a huge amount of the work that I do with organizations is focused around a central point, which is I want to move organizations away from a calendar of events to a culture of change. Um, and the reason that I say that is because much like with workplace wellness, what we see sometimes with diversity, equity and inclusion is a lot of calendar events and a lot of initiatives, but not a lot of strategic innovation in relation to creating a culture of change within an organization. So there's lots of doing, there's lots of things happening in the calendar, but there's potentially not that strategic drive to build a culture of change and actually asking ourselves, what does a culture of change look like? How long does it take to create one? And are we in it for the long haul? Um, so who are we? Um, so we are a social wellness and diversity, equity and inclusion consultancy. And I think it's important to, to focus on that bit primarily as well, first and foremost, prior to starting my business three years ago, I spent about 10 years working in addiction recovery, mental health, reducing reoffending and organizational well-being. Um, and I think it was that kind of trifecta of experience that made me realize that sometimes when I go into organizations, they have a really great workplace wellness strategy or really great workplace wellness initiatives and not so great diversity, equity and inclusion ones or vice versa. For me, it's the recognition that social wellness, workplace wellness and DEI are inextricably and intimately linked. Because if we're not focusing on both of those things and understanding the importance of the connection between them, we're essentially not allowing people who are from minoritized communities within our workplace feel well in the workplace because they potentially are being failed in one area or another for me as an individual i am a mixed race woman of jamaican french and english heritage i know what you're thinking as you're looking at me um the joke in my family is that the printer ran out of ink i am one of the youngest children um and also my family often call me the mixed race ninja because i am unseen in spaces very often in relation to my racial identity but in and of itself that gave me quite an interesting insight and it's 
useful, I think, to pick up on the conversation that was just happening around privilege. For me, growing up as a very light skinned, white assumed mixed race woman in my family was growing up with a recognition of my privilege in action. The way that people engage with me can sometimes be incredibly different to the way that they engage with my dad or my brother, who are both much darker than I am. And there was a real recognition for me around how do I begin to utilize that privilege for the benefit of others? So rather than feeling awkward and uncomfortable about having it, what can I do with it? And that's a lot of the reason why I work with organizations now to think about creating a culture of change. Again, coming back to the points that were made earlier, I think the only way that we get to sustainable culture change in organizations is first and foremost, a recognition that yes, some of these conversations can be highly uncomfortable for people. They can make people feel uncomfortable. And actually, I think it's okay to recognize that we feel uncomfortable. The next step though, I think is leaning into that uncomfortability. Like Gunan was saying, we need to get to a place where we're comfortable being uncomfortable because part of that is the recognition of asking ourselves, how do I, how do I overcome my defensiveness in this moment? My desire to want to put across my opinion, defend myself, think about all of the reasons I'm not, or on the flip side of that, how do I challenge my own apathy? It's not my issue. It doesn't affect me. This is something for other people in the organization. DNI is not for me, so therefore I don't need to be engaged. The reality is diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives are for everyone in an organization. We all need to be part of the conversation because we all have a role to play in creating cultural change. So what am I going to be talking to you about today? Um, so the title kind of gives it away. We're going to be talking about strategic DNI, and i um, and that's very much why we need to start walking the talk. The reality is over the last couple of years, particularly following the murder of George Floyd in 2020, I have been contacted by a massive number of organizations who in 2020 were super keen, wanted to do so much, absolutely on it. Diversity, equity and inclusion was the new buzzword. Everyone wanted to get it into their organizations. And as it stopped trending on Instagram and it stopped becoming a hashtag and the conversations became less and less, those conversations and those phone calls began to dwindle and people that had come out with quite big statements in organizations actually from from the staff's perspective were failing to walk the talk. So there was a lot of big mission statements, there were a lot of conversations, but it didn't feel like there was a huge amount of sustainable action within organizations about what this really meant and how we continue it. So for me, the conversation is really around how do we walk the talk? And part of walking that talk is thinking about how do we empower staff from minoritized backgrounds to feel part of the creation of strategy and the ongoing cultural change in the organization, but also how do we create a culture that is both top down and bottom up. Because sometimes what tends to happen in organizations is that strategy is created from above and cascaded down. And there isn't a sense of ownership from staff on the ground in relation to that strategy. They may not feel that they had a role to play in creating it, that their voices aren't heard in it, that they don't see themselves reflected in it. So for me, that whole strategic direction is about collaboration, connection and community in workplaces. It's also about the importance of data. Data is one of the most important aspects for getting strategic in diversity, equity and inclusion, because if we don't have data, we have no idea whether or not we're doing well. We have no idea what success looks like. We potentially then are on a journey with no roadmap and no destination. So we kind of get to the end of 12 months and go, is it working? No, is it? We need to make sure that we think about what data looks like from a diversity, equity and inclusion perspective. Um, and then as Ganan said, one of the things that we're also going to talk about is active allyship. So having conversations about privilege is incredibly important and privilege in relation to the way that it shows up in a variety of different ways for individuals. And this was touched upon earlier. I think we all hold 
and can hold both privilege and oppression simultaneously in different aspects of our identity related to intersectionality. So privilege is not an either or conversation and we, we have to stop treating it like it is. It's not something that you either have or you don't. It can be a part of your identity, but also oppression can be an, another part of that identity based on different aspects. When we get to a place of understanding privilege from a more complex and nuanced point of view, we then need to start asking ourselves, how do I utilize my privilege? And that's where allyship comes in. How do I begin to utilize my privilege for the benefit of other people? And how can I be an effective ally in the workplace? So we've been talking about the fact that it's a time for actions and not words, but I also do think that it's important that we think about what are the words that are associated with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I know that this list was put up earlier, but I also think that there's something important about continuously going through it. So when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, socioeconomic status, I also think is a really important one. And actually it's one that we don't talk about enough. Class in the UK is an incredible, conversation that we don't have in relation to other aspects of diversity equity and inclusion particularly in relation to intersectionality we are in a cost of living crisis at the moment we have people who are actively struggling to live everyday life to pay the bills to take care of themselves and their family that has a huge impact on their ability to engage in workplaces and in the community okay you also um are you moving your slide? Because it doesn't seem to be showing here. Oh, is it not? No, it's on the first slide still. Oh, hold on. What's going on? Let me try that again. Ooh. See, I knew this tech was not gonna. <laughs> but we've got your slides as well if it makes if it if it's easier. Oh, hold on. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see that one. Slide four, was it? Yeah, but it's not. Hmm. Let me. If you're struggling, Jade, I could have a go. Just wonder a bit of it, because it's a PDF. Yeah. It seems to be, is that working? No. So we can see it, we can see slides four. Okay, if I go into, if I go into full screen, it seems to want to pause the screen sharing. Hmm. That's not helpful. Would you like me to have a try, Jade? Yeah, if you could, please. Me. Sorry, it's always the uh, it's always the tech. No, it's fine. It, always, it happens to the best of That's us. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. So now people aren't thinking, what is this woman talking about? There is nothing on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, thinking about terminology, again, coming back to that point around socioeconomic status, I think there is something incredibly important about the way that we talk about the intersectionality of class in this country and the importance of the recognition of where we are socially. We have literally yesterday just seen one of the largest strikes in recent history in relation to people genuinely acknowledging that from a cost of living perspective, they are struggling. That has a massive impact on how we then engage in diversity, equity and inclusion and the strategies that we create in organisations. Education obviously was mentioned before, political views, <clears throat> and also spiritual and religious beliefs. 
the thing for me around equity is that we have moved the conversation on. So we used to talk about equality and now we talk more about equity in organizations. And I think that there is an important distinction to be made there. We used to think about equality as leveling the playing field. And I think now organizations are much more aware that equity is the conversation that we need to be having, which is more for those who need it. We do not all start at the same place in life. When we line up for the race of life, there are some people who are starting much further back in relation to support and resources, upbringing, attainment, education, class, ethnicity, we need to think about where people are and what support and requirements they need to put them in a position where they are able not only to survive, but to thrive in life. The other aspect is around inclusion. And for me, I think inclusion is a really big one. I think about inclusion as how do I feel welcomed and included in all aspects of my lived identity? The recognition that there are so many aspects that make up who I am, that I don't want to be honed down to a single aspect of identity. And I also want to feel a sense of belonging and safety in my environments. I want to feel empowered to speak up and to speak out and to be able to exist as my full authentic self in a workplace. I think the interesting thing also from a DEI perspective is that very often when we talk about DEI and organizations think about DEI, they think about the importance of increasing diversity in the organization as the first start. But the reality is for me, it needs to be the other way around. If we're not working on creating inclusive environments, we're bringing more and more people into an environment that is potentially unsafe. So actually, for me, the important thing is how do we have a conversation and create a culture around inclusion and belonging and then think about enhancing our recruitment and retention practices to ensure that we have a lot of people in our organization with a huge amount of lived experience and different identities that feel safe here. Otherwise, we end up with a lot of people in an organization who are ticking boxes, they're ticking the HR boxes of diversity and inclusion, makes a lovely poster, but actually none of those people feel empowered or safe enough to be able to speak out about the reality of their lived experience within that workplace. Um, next slide, please. So there's three aspects to this. I think when we think about strategy and taking meaningful action, we need to be asking ourselves the importance of authenticity, does what we're doing feel authentic? Because if it doesn't feel authentic, people will not buy into it. If it feels like it's a checkbox exercise, if it feels like we're saying the right things without doing the right things, we will lose people before we've even started. Accountability is also something that is incredibly important when we think about the strategic aspect of DEI. Are we holding ourselves accountable? as an organization, as a senior leadership team, as an executive leadership team, are we holding ourselves accountable? And if we are getting it wrong, are we acknowledging it? Do we own it and think about how we can get it better moving forward? Or is there a lack of accountability in the organization and somehow it's everyone else's issue as to why it isn't working? And the third one is, is it sustainable? Because like I was saying earlier, post 2020, there was a lot of big talk. And actually a lot of that talk wasn't sustainable in relation to the action. We're now in a position where we need to think about the future of our organizations. What does DEI in terms of a strategic response look like in relation to the future of our organization? How are we embedding a strategy that's gonna see us through the next year, three years, five years? How do we ensure it's sustainable? How do we evaluate it? How do we ensure that people continue to feel that they have a sense of ownership over it? Uh, next slide, please. So when we think about walking the talk, the question really comes down to why does strategy matter? Why should it be the most important thing in relation to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I think there are a couple of really key points here. One is that having a good strategy in relation to diversity, equity and inclusion and also workplace wellness, the recognition that you need both of those things 
is preparing your organization for the future. It's an opportunity to begin looking ahead, identifying one, where you are now, but secondly, where do you want to be? Where are you going? What does success look like? And what are the possible challenges or barriers or hurdles that you're going to experience along the course of the journey? It's also thinking about in this moment, are you looking forward or are you simply treading water? Is it just a lot of initiatives without any clear plan? Are you doing bits and bobs in the organization to think about making sure that the conversation is continuing? Or are you genuinely looking forward with an understanding of where you see this organization going in the future? The other thing that I think is important in relation to a strategy, particularly around diversity, equity and inclusion, is that post COVID changes to working practices are here to stay we're not going to go back wholesale to what was we're in a situation now where actually we're moving out of covid crisis mode in some respects we're thinking about the way that organizations have changed the way that working practices have changed hybrid working is something that we talk about far more often now than we ever have before but there is a dei issue in relation to hybrid working i remember having conversations with people where within an organization there was a lot of chat about how great home working had been and how much people were enjoying it. And for younger people in that organization, actually saying it hasn't been an enjoyable experience for me. I don't have a home office. I work it. I live in cramped accommodation. I'm working on an upturned laundry basket and my mental health is genuinely suffering. So even in those moments of thinking about working practices, there's a diversity, equity and inclusion conversation. What does that look like for different people within our organization? What does it look like across different identities, across different intersections of identities? How are we supporting individuals to engage in working practices that work for them? I think the other big thing is also that a job is no longer for life anymore. We know that employees are seeking equity in organizations. It's one of the biggest things that younger generations are looking for when they go into the workplace. They want to know whether or not they're going to feel included, whether there's a sense of belonging, what do DEI strategies look like, what does workplace wellness look like, and if they don't find it in an organisation, they're prepared to walk away. We are moving from a job for life where people were in jobs for 25, 30 years to younger generations that want to see themselves reflected in the workplace, that want to see work-life balance, that want to see an ability to engage in work-life blend, but also want to see those conversations around DEI and workplace wellness, mental health as a priority within the organization. And where they don't find that, many of those young people are thinking about different options or different organizations where they will get the things that they need. So as an organization, we also need to be mindful about how are we not only recruiting staff, but how are we retaining staff? I talked a little bit earlier around moving from a calendar of events to a culture of change. Um, and I think that's also something that's fundamentally important. So understanding and addressing the causes rather than reacting to the symptoms. We need to think about this isn't about putting a band-aid over a wound. This is about the recognition of what are the causes of the issues that we see in workplaces. Because if we're only dealing with the symptoms, we end up in reactive crisis mode rather than planning mode, where we think about what needs to change, how can it change, how will we evaluate that change and how will we feed back that change? It's also asking ourselves, how does DEI show up in different touch points along the employee journey. And this was picked up slightly earlier by Ganan in terms of thinking about we have a multi generational workforce now and the needs of workers in different stages of their life need to be acknowledged and accommodated. So we've had a lot of organizations recently talking about the importance of engaging in work around menopause policy, for example, and strategies to ensure that women don't leave the workforce because they are struggling with aspects of the menopause and not finding that support within the organization. We also have younger workers in our organizations right now that, like I said before, because of hybrid working or that move to remote working, don't feel that they are engaging in the social aspect of work in the way that potentially you or I did. 
or are worried about their career progression and what that looks like for them if they're not being seen physically in spaces. How do we engage people in innovation, in understanding and in education if we're not in rooms together? And that's not to say that we're going to go back to all nine to five bums on seats seven hours a day. But it is to say that organizations have a responsibility right now to think about how do we utilize the physical space going forward to prioritize social connection and innovation? Because we need to make sure that we get people in rooms at some points to allow them to connect with one another, to be able to share differences of opinions and lived experiences. One of the things that came out of the research over COVID was what was called psychological closing. And it's something that is incredibly detrimental for diversity, equity and inclusion. So with a lot of home working and a lot of people remote working, where there were disagreements or where people didn't agree with what somebody was saying, or it was a different perspective, it was a different lived experience, people were muting laptops, shutting off videos, walking away, going to make a cup of tea. So there was this process of psychological closing happening where people weren't engaging in those difficult, uncomfortable conversations because it was easier to just remove themselves entirely because of that remote aspect. The laptop almost provided a wall to not engage with the conversation. And we need to be mindful about how we utilize technology going forward. There are absolutely some incredible benefits of technology from a very inclusive perspective. It can be incredibly inclusive for a huge amount of people to utilize technology in the way that we are now. But we also have to think about there is something profoundly important about people being in a space with one another physically, sharing different viewpoints, sharing lived experiences and being able to exchange ideas. It's also about how do you embed DEI in your communications? So is it something that runs like a golden thread throughout the organization? Is it talked about in meetings? Is it brought up in the everyday aspects of day-to-day -day working? Is it spoken about by your SLT or your ELT? What does it look like in terms of communicating diversity, equity, and inclusion? Are you bringing people into those communications? And most importantly, are we prepared to share some of our failures related to diversity, equity, and inclusion? A lot of times when I work with organizations, they will say to me, we absolutely want to do the right thing. We have a really strong intention to do the right thing, but we're terrified of doing the wrong thing, of saying the wrong thing, of offending somebody. My answer is always, that is probably going to happen. At some point, you potentially are going to get it wrong. And that's part of the learning journey, because if we're not prepared to make mistakes, we're also not prepared to learn. It's part of creating a growth mindset organization, the recognition that if we make people terrified of failure and give them a fear of failure, they will never step out of their comfort zone into that place of uncomfortability and move through that to the point that was made earlier to curiosity, to active learning. We have to recognize that mistakes will happen and we have to, from an organizational perspective, think about how do we communicate those mistakes and how do we role model a growth mindset from a leadership perspective? If leaders in an organization feel more confident saying, these are the ways that I've got it wrong in the course of my journey in this organization, but these are all the things that I learn from the things that I got wrong. We are empowering other people in the organization to feel that they can be a part of the conversation, whether they know everything or they don't, we are committed to learning here. So I think a growth mindset aspect to an organization is one of the most profoundly important things, particularly in relation to conversations around DEI, where people do have that fear of failure. It also provides a common frame of reference, what's required from people and what do they gain? One of the biggest things I think for me in working with organizations is trying to get that collaboration of strategy. So how do we get staff involved in the creation of strategy? How do we make sure that that strategy is both top down and bottom up? Because if it isn't, a lot of times within organizations, we'll ask, we'll go in and we'll talk to people about the strategy and we'll go, you know, what is it? What does it say? Where are you on the journey? What goals have you already achieved? 
the strategy is either living on the shelf or it's stuffed in the drawer and people know that there is one but there isn't a whole scale sense of ownership over it including people in the creation of your strategy from all aspects of your organization giving them the opportunity to tell you what they need from that strategy to feel that they are not just surviving here but thriving here gives everyone a sense of ownership it makes people aware of where we're going how we want to get there and what we need from you to be able to do that so it's bringing to life what equity looks like on a practical level how can employees be a part of the solution how can they get involved what do they need to know how can they support other colleagues how can they be supported themselves and how does diversity equity and inclusion positively impact other workplace issues like workplace wellness so is there an acknowledgement in your strategy about the well-being of people from minoritized communities in your workplace because we know that those two things are going to absolutely have an impact on one another so it's important when we're thinking from a strategic perspective how do we make sure that we're creating something that people one understand secondly buy into thirdly feel is communicated effectively throughout the organization and also is sustainable that we are in this for the long haul warts and all failures and all but we will learn together um i'm seeing a couple of things coming up in the chat so i'm just gonna also just open it up if anybody wants to jump in with a question or a comment at this point before we move on to the next slide Uh, so we've got some questions there about there's be a period of education and behavioral movement by creating psychological safety, but we also need to consider a system whether we want to encourage and enable an equity to continue by not addressing it. Doing nothing isn't a safe choice either, absolutely. Um, I think that's a really important point that a lot of communication is one dimensional whilst people are multi dimensional communication and allowing people to buy into the vision is fundamentally important. How are we speaking to people within our organization and how do we see people within our organization? I think one of the interesting parts about that is the saying that has been going around now for the last couple of years related to COVID. We have all been in the same storm, but we haven't been in the same boat. And do our organizations and do we as individuals or leaders within those organizations understand and recognize what life has looked like for a variety of different members of staff through COVID? What have been some of the things that they've struggled with? What do they need from us now going forward? How do we understand our workforce and recognize that they're not one homogenous group of people? Uh, so moving on to the next slide. So I know that Ganan is going to talk you through this, so I'm not going to do a huge amount of conversation now about psychological safety. But I do think it's important to mention one of the most important ways, and I touched on this earlier, that we can empower not only minoritized communities in our workplaces, but everyone within our workplaces is creating a culture of psychological safety. And it speaks to the point that I made earlier that very often we focus on the diversity and equity and see the inclusion as the last piece of the puzzle. When actually we really need to be focusing on the inclusion first, because if we're creating initiatives in an organization that doesn't feel or hasn't created psychological safety. Individuals aren't going to feel safe enough to speak up or to speak out. So that puts us in a position from an organizational perspective where we might send out surveys to get a sense of where we are in relation to DEI. And we get a lot of neutral answers or actually what we get is a lot of people saying things that they potentially think that we want to hear or it's easier to say because they actually don't feel safe enough to share the way that they genuinely feel about DEI in the organization. Partly because they're worried about where does that information go who sees it and what happens with it? And what does that look like for me in terms of conversations within the organization after I have spoken up or spoken out? Does it lead to other people becoming defensive? Does it lead to us finding solutions? Does it potentially single me out where people then wanna continuously pick my brain to find out 
how I feel traumatized within the organization or what's happened to me that's made me feel this way. We have to be able to create psychological safety where people have an ability and a network and a safety net to tell organizations where it isn't working and that that acts as a springboard for change. It's also around where we might have uh, implemented initiatives, for example, around recruitment, retention or progression. Some people might have been recruited into positions. Uh, some people might have engaged in progression within the organization. There's in some senses this feeling that that in and of itself is us doing DEI well. Those people that are in those positions may be in some sense a sign of progress, but if they still don't feel seen, heard or valued in those positions, in the fullness of their identity or lived experience, then we haven't done a huge amount for diversity equity, or inclusion in an authentic or sustainable way. It's also around this piece of walking the talk. We know that many times in an organization, people will feel disengaged or feel uncertain about the sustainability of a diversity, equity and inclusion initiative if they don't see SLT middle managers or senior managers walking the talk. So if it feels like something that's being done to staff, as opposed to a change of culture, we don't get that buy-in from all levels and staff on the ground don't feel that they're seeing DEI in action because they're not seeing middle managers, managers or SLT walking the talk. That undermines the ability to build and sustain psychological safety. If we're not all prepared to talk about it and to talk about the challenges, to talk about the things that we've learned, talk about the ways that we have succeeded, but also the areas that we've got it wrong. We're asking other people to do things that we're not prepared to do ourselves. So DEI becomes something done to rather than built for. And there's a fundamental difference in those two things. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's just going to pick up on something that's come, come up in the chat. Um, there's a couple of things. One is home working has looked very different for lots of people. And I think that hits the nail completely on the head. Home working has not in any way, shape or form been similar for everybody within an organization. Some people have absolutely loved it, thrived during it and found it fantastic. And I know many, many people that have absolutely hated it, felt incredibly socially isolated, very disconnected and really couldn't wait to get back into an office environment. And also, for example, like I was saying earlier, younger generations that have joined companies or joined organizations during the pandemic and have never physically met their team or feel that they've come and joined in a place now where they're unsure of themselves, unsure about how to reach out to people, unsure about asking for help, unsure about continuing professional development or career opportunities. So we need to be really mindful about the, the reality of the lived experience of work from home in relation to COVID. Um, and I think Ganan's point there is also really important around surveys. Even when surveys are anonymous, if you are a person in your in your organization from a minoritized community and there are not many people from your particular minoritized community in that workplace, it can often be very easy to feel that you are going to be identifiable in terms of what you say. And that doesn't create psychological safety if people are concerned about how their feedback will be used. If we've created safety and we've empowered people to share with honesty, with a recognition that this is about moving forward, they are going to be less worried about being singled out in an organization based on the things that they've said. Moving towards individuals. So we've empowered, we're thinking about empowerment through psychological safety within an organization. And then we're also thinking about how do we empower people through training programs and networks. One of the big things for me is that training within an organization is fundamentally important. We have to provide people with an opportunity to understand what DEI is and also cultural humility. We need to put people in a position where they recognize that DEI is not something for those people over there. It's for everyone. 
we all need to have an awareness and an understanding of not only what those terms mean and how we embody them in an organization, but also that all staff need to get to a place where they feel confident and comfortable discussing aspects of DEI. So things like culture, privilege, allyship, how are these words understood within your organization and how are those conversations being had with everybody? Because the reality is that we need everyone on board to create sustainable positive change. So if DEI is seen as a side of the desk job or it's seen as something that is only for minoritized communities, we're getting it wholly wrong because we're not bringing in enough people who hold the privilege to be able to create the change. Those people aren't present in the conversations. And so therefore what tends to happen is that DEI just becomes a talking shop and actually the people that hold the power and the privilege who can create the sustainable change aren't part of the bigger conversation and aren't sure how they should utilize their privilege or their power to create change in the organization. That also feeds into though, ensuring that we have networks that provide safe spaces for minoritized communities to be able to share their experiences, to have a sense of being able to talk to one another about how it feels to work in the organization and to draw strength and understanding from people from a similar identity background to them. The important thing though in relation to networks is actually also making sure that there is an intersectional approach to them and that there is an overarching aim because one of the things that sometimes happens in organizations is that they set up a number of different networks for a number of different individuals. And when we think about the intersectionality of an individual, if you are a queer black woman, how many of those spaces are you required to attend to feel that your needs are being met in relation to the intersectionality of your identity? And are we putting an extra burden on people by saying you need to, you, you know, you might want to attend this one and then also this one and then also this one where's the intersectional approach to that where is the understanding that some of those networks should be pe for, for people who identify in a variety of different intersectional identities to ensure that there isn't an added labor burden on them to engage in the networks that speak to their lived experience because we're niching them down so much Mentoring is also an incredibly important part of DEI from a strategic perspective in an organization. The provision of mentoring for minority communities that supports personal and professional development provided by mentors who share lived experience is a representation of progress in action. It provides incredible opportunities for people to find support, but also to create powerful networks that are going to enhance their career development and career opportunities over time. Uh, next slide, please. So with all of that being said, how do we create a culture of change? What does that look like in practice? So we can talk about moving from a calendar of events to creating a culture of change, but what is it that we're talking about when we say that? How do we begin to take stock? So first and foremost, engaging in a systematic review, which provides an honest and accurate rec uh, reflection of where your organization stands. And I'm really, kind of emphasizing the words honest and accurate representation, because it can be very easy sometimes from a place of fear or from a place of wanting to get it right to, from an organizational perspective, to try and make ourselves look better than we are from a DEI perspective. We're not doing too badly. People say that, you know, it's, it's okay here. But the question we need to be asking ourselves is, where are we really and according to who? Because if we're only taking feedback or we're only engaging in data from a minority of people within the organization that feel that it's going well, and we're kind of disassociate, disassociating ourselves from those individuals that are saying that it really isn't going well here, and we're trying to create something that feels quite positive, we, we're not taking stock in an authentic way, but we're also shooting ourselves in, in the foot in our ability to be able to move forward. We have to be what I call in some senses, ugly honest about our starting point. Where are we genuinely starting according to who in this organization? So for some people, they may feel that actually 
we're doing pretty well. For other people, it may feel that there isn't a psychological safety here or from, for, from their particular identity perspective, it doesn't feel safe. We need to take a huge amount of um, different viewpoints and opinions into consideration. We need to make sure that when we're going out and creating surveys and identifying focus groups, we're really leaning into the importance of that qualitative data. And I'm going to come into that when I talk about the importance of data in the next slide. Um, creating strategy. I've kind of banged on about this a lot over the last kind of 40 minutes or so, but co-producing a DEI strategy is fundamentally important because it provides ownership. It gives you the opportunity to have staff be involved in the creation of a strategy that they will own and they will be a part of in the short term and the long term. It also means that everyone in your organization knows what the mission is, knows what the journey ahead looks like and knows what is expected and required of them to get there. That sense of ownership is profoundly important. It also is the recognition of how is DNI recognized across the lifespan of an individual in your organization? So how, how do individuals engage with your diversity, equity and inclusion strategy at different points in their career path, different points of their identity, different points of their lived experience? Part of that creation of the strategy is also then thinking about tying it to the policies and practices in your organization. And that's fundamentally important. And I say that because I had a conversation recently with an organization who were incredibly proud of the fact that they had really got on board with conversations about the menopause in the workplace and that they had created a new menopause policy. Um, and it was largely a group of men from an SLT. And my first question was, was there anybody that's actively going through the menopause that contributed to this policy development and there was silence in the room when we get serious about our strategy and when we create ownership we also ask ourselves the bigger question around policy what does our policy look like sound like and feel like to the people that are going to need to use it because if our menopause policy has been written by somebody who's never been through the menopause and if our discrimination policy has been written by somebody who isn't from a minoritized identity and is potentially never going to use that policy in a time of crisis or a time of need, how do we know how helpful that feels in the moment? The next part of that is also thinking about from a DEI perspective, how inclusive is the language in that policy? How easy to understand is it? If I'm in a situation in a workplace where I require a racial discrimination policy, is it that difficult to understand that that's also going to put me into an added crisis mode trying to figure out where I go, who I seek support from and what the next steps are? It's really important from that perspective that we think about are our policies designed by people who potentially may need to use them and also from an understanding point of view, how do they read in a moment where somebody genuinely needs them? What does that look like for people? And how can we create DEI in all aspects of what we do? The last part is measuring success and evaluation. And this comes back to the importance of data. So identifying and measuring success so you know if you're on track. If you have a very firm understanding of where you started and you've also identified key performance indicators, critical success factors, you also then know if you're on track with the things that you want to deliver. Part of that is also about implementing a robust evaluation process. Do you evaluate your strategy on a six monthly basis, a yearly basis? And when you do, do you do that in a way that provides you with an opportunity to reflect, to reassess, and to also most importantly, inform colleagues of progress? Do you send that information back down so that colleagues know these are the things we've done really well on. These are some of the continued hurdles and barriers that we face. These are our priorities in the next three months and give them opportunities to feel involved in all aspects of where we're going. Have you created a data hierarchy? And this is an interesting question because sometimes from a data perspective, 
a lot of organizations get really caught up in doing surveys that give a huge amount of quantitative data. So there's loads of really nice pie charts and really nice graphs and we can get a quick read of where people are without any qualitative data that speaks to the lived experience of individuals within your organization. Are you allowing people to be heard and seen in their own voice? We need to start thinking about quantitative data as queen because the reality from a data perspective is that nothing gives us richer data than qualitative data. We get a tremendous insight into what's working, what isn't, but we also allow people when we give them the space to use their own words to help us provide some of the solutions to the issues around DNI. If we're only focusing on one aspect of data, we're not getting the whole story and we're not allowing people to be heard and seen in their own lived experience identity with their own words. Uh, next slide, please. So bring, thinking about the importance of data, um, it isn't just a snapshot and it shouldn't just be a snapshot. Data shouldn't just be a couple of poll surveys, a couple of times a year, mostly focused on quantitative data, a few pie charts, we're doing well on this, not so well on this. The importance of data is that it can be fundamentally helpful in tracking the journey of employees, which allows organizations to identify the barriers and the opportunities for change. It's also important because we know, for example, in a recent report that women of color are significantly more likely to search for information about an organization's ethnic diversity, gender balance, ethnicity pay gap, policies, data, survey feedback. People want to know what they're stepping into, what this organization is doing, what's working and what isn't. So this isn't just data that becomes something within the organization is the importance of the realization that that data is also transcending your organization and people that are potential joiners are looking at that data to see where you are on the journey, where is left to go and how you intend to get there. But it's also thinking about how when we're taking that snapshot and tracking employees journeys who's starting who's staying who's getting promoted who's leaving, why are they leaving? That gives us a huge amount of understanding around where some of those pinch points for DEI could be. It also allows us to think about, is there trends here? Are we losing people at a particular point? Are we, are we losing people of a particular minoritized identity? Why? What are they saying in their exit interviews? Are we conducting thorough exit interviews to allow people to give an honest and accurate representation of the workplace if they have decided to leave? Where does that information go? What do we do with it? And how do we utilize it to create positive change? It's also going deeper with the data. So how do we explore intersectionality within the data and embrace things like focus groups and qualitative data, like I said before? That recognition that the lived experience of people from an intersectional identity is going to be different. And also the recognition that was identified previously that even people from minoritized communities, we're not a homogenous group of people. We don't all think the same, feel the same and do the same or want the same. So how are we exploring intersectionality within our data? How do we understand the difference, for example, between Black African, Black Caribbean, mixed race? What does that look like in terms of people's needs and wants within an organization? And how does that show up either within diversity and inclusion or workplace wellness? Third and, four, and, and importantly is, is your data aligned to your key performance indicators and your critical success factors? Don't engage in data collection just for the sake of it, because what happens is that then survey fatigue sets in and people kind of get yet another survey, yet another pulse check, something that's around, we wanna know how you're feeling about DNI in the organization. And they feel like survey fatigue is, is setting in because they're almost being used in some senses for quantitative data analysis but not getting a sense of what's coming back from that where does that survey data go how is it being used and how does it implement changes on the journey also how is it aligned to the kpis so if we've got kpis in relation to recruitment and retention how are we crafting our data analysis and data questions to make sure that we know whether it's working or it isn't 
It's also thinking about the fact that not all data is created equal. It's great in an organization to have data around DEI, but if it's incredibly complex, very difficult to understand, and doesn't make a huge amount of sense to middle managers or other individuals within the organization, there's no point in having it. So in some senses, it's thinking about how do we also, not only how do we capture data, but how do we then use that data to give people a snapshot and an insight into where we are? This is where dashboards can be incredibly useful and important. How do we present our data? Does it feel easily readable to everyone in our organization? Can you click into a dashboard and get a really quick sense of where we are in relation to the strategy, what's working, what isn't, where there might be room for improvement? Because if we're drowning in data that doesn't make sense to anyone, it's not going to be useful from a strategic perspective in relation to creating change. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to, I've seen a couple of chat messages come up. Uh, around uh, exit interviews, again, super, super important. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point there from David Brown around um, exit interviews being carried out online, not providing the best result because face-to-face -face is vital and being carried out by someone from a different division or department. That I think is a really, really important conversation from a DEI perspective around how do you get that psychological safety for individuals that absolutely, I think, is not something that can be authentically done online. I think you need that face to face interaction. And I also think that you absolutely need somebody who feels objective to the person who's leaving the organization so that they feel that they have the ability to have an honest conversation about the things that weren't working and what that looks like. So. Four minutes. Yep, no problem. Um, so thinking then about carrying out a SWOT analysis for DEI. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats? So giving ourselves the opportunity to get really honest about where we are and the recognition of the things that we are good at. What sets us apart from other people? What do we do really well? But also what do we lack? And which areas are we potentially failing in? Where can we seek inspiration? And what have we not considered? whose voices haven't been heard around this table because they're not present in the room and why aren't they present in the room it's asking ourselves the deeper questions also what are the challenges up ahead what does the future look like if we do nothing now that's a massive question for organizations at this point if we do nothing now what does the future look like and I can guarantee that it probably doesn't look very positive or very rosy. We have an opportunity to create sustainable, authentic change, but we have to be honest enough to get there. The next slide, please. So what does this then look like in terms of active allyship? Um, there's been a lot of conversation over the last two years, particularly on social media about allies and allyship. And in some ways it has become a bit of a buzzword um, with people thinking that allyship is kind of this A and B linear progression. You see something, you do something. That's me being an ally. I've done my job. I get to pat myself on the back and move on. The reality of allyship in the same way that the reality of privilege is much more complex and nuanced than we give credit for. To me, allyship is thinking about, and this definition from Beyond Equality is one that I love, is leveraging your privilege to make something that's not your issue, your issue, and then using your influence to remove barriers to other people's inclusion. So how do we move from a place of feeling uncomfortable or guilty about our privilege to recognizing that we actually should all possess privilege in this world? Those things that we see as privileges are an ability to be able to live well. So how can we utilize our privilege to engage in active allyship? What does that look like? First and foremost, I think one of the biggest things about the importance of authentic allyship is that it starts with an understanding of the history of inequalities in our society and how they continue. That responsibility needs to be on the individual to educate themselves about the history of inequalities in this country. Otherwise, if we don't, if we aren't educated or we don't feel educated about the issues that we're stepping into, 
we potentially do more harm than good in our allyship. It's also an understanding of our own, our own privilege and how it can be utilized. It's a commitment to supporting others in the way that they would like to be supported. So sometimes what can happen from an allyship perspective is that we kind of bounce into the room with a ton of ideas about how we're gonna fix all of the inequalities that people are facing. So we've got so much energy for the work that needs to be done because we are not part of the community that have faced hundreds of years of oppression and inequality. We're not exhausted by the inequalities faced in society. So we come in and we almost take over the conversation and go, this is what you need to do. We need to be asking people how they want to be supported. What does allyship look like to them? What would be most useful to them? And it's then being able to step outside of ourselves and not make a judgment on whichever answer we get in that moment. Different people want others to show up for them in different ways. There is not one particular way to do allyship. It's also that willingness to make mistakes, the ability to get uncomfortable and recognize that you probably are going to get it wrong sometimes, and that's also okay. It's thinking about how you can engage in an authentic and honest opinion and learn from what went wrong in order to do better next time. And what does that look like? So like I said, allyship can look different in different contexts. It might be sponsoring somebody. It could be championing them. How do you talk about other people in the rooms that they're either in or not in? How do you ensure that people from minoritized communities have their voices heard in spaces where they aren't present? And how do you also then champion to have them present in those spaces? How do you allow them to engage in networking opportunities that may previously have been closed off to them? How do you amplify voices? How do you ensure that in meetings you're giving people the opportunity to be heard through their, for their own, through their own lived experience and their own voice? How do you advocate for people? What does that look like? Are you a scholar? Do you take the time to understand those history of inequalities, to do your own research, to be a better support to people in your organization that are facing inequality? Are you an upstander? Do you speak out when somebody makes a joke or a remark that's derogatory or offensive, or do you wait for everybody else to say something first? The reality for me in terms of DEI is that we will know when we're making tangible progress in an organization, when somebody says something derogatory and everybody says, we don't tolerate that here, rather than waiting for the person that's been harmed in the interaction to speak up and educate everybody else about why it isn't okay. We all need to become upstanders in our organizations. Are you a confidant? Do people feel comfortable and confident coming to you to share their issues or concerns, knowing that you will support them to take action to create change? Uh, next slide, please. So to round up, um, there are a couple of personal reflections, and these are things just to think about in relation to post today. Um, what's the first thing that you remember about today's session? What did you like and enjoy? What stood out for you? But also what made you feel ill at ease or uncomfortable? I think Ganan mentioned it earlier, being able to identify those areas of uncomfortability, what's coming up for you in those moments and why? And what's one thing that you want to undertake, do or not do in the coming week as a result of today's session? How can you keep that accountability for yourself as an individual? What's one thing that you would like to change? Um, next slide. So I just want to say a massive thank you uh, for having me here today to talk about strategic DEI. Um, I know I've ran over time slightly. I don't know if we've got any time to do some questions if people do have questions or I'm just about to be booted off for running over. <laughs> we, we try not be, to be too rude, Jade, but uh, yeah, in, in the interest of time, um, I suppose, um, because we want to come back to uh, to Gunal and just um, close by looking more about that psychological safety that you referenced, actually. So are you staying with us, Jade, until the end? Or yeah, do you I will need do. To? Is that OK? So perhaps if we if we um, run through to the end and then perhaps uh, we've got time, open up for questions. And if people have got anything specific, then perhaps pop it in the chat so that we can we can just manage that and feed those Perfect. through to you. That would be really helpful, I think. Thank you. So thank so you. without further ado, I'll just uh, just pause to say a huge thank you to you, Jade, for, for your input this morning. Uh, and I say we will come back to you at the end. But I think some really, really um, helpful food for thought there around that strategic um, mindset and, and actually some really practical things. Because although you focused on the strategic aspect, there's some 
real practical things there that I'm sure you know lots of takeaways um, for us that we, we can um, consider. So a huge thank you for, for, to you for that. And I'd like to now welcome back Gunan to talk around um, psychological safety and to draw our session to a close this morning. So thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. I really enjoyed that, Jade. Um, well, a couple of things really um, shouted at me was the retention, um, because a lot of times, especially within organisations, they do all these um, so-called positive action, but they don't change the environment and they don't change um, the, the, there's no cultural change at all. The, the, the organisation is still the same. They have all this positive, you know, recruitment. And then within six months to a year, people start leaving because it wasn't safe for them. And I love the fact you mentioned co-designer because that is so, so important. Um, and about intersectionality as well. Can we go to the next slide? So Jade more or less touched on this, but have a quick read and then we'll go to the next slide. So maybe a minute. Um, and while you read that, I'll share some some examples. So Jade in her um, in her session talked about intersectionalities. So many people now are I mean we've always been intersectional, um, but people are a lot more comfortable talking about it. And um, in the Netherlands, I interviewed um, the EDI EDI um, executive, and she has. Um, she's created something called the Blend Club, which is, you know, it's a blend club because she she didn't feel that it was good to have a women's only club, a race group, a religious group. So she said for change to happen within the organization, people needed to be in the room, but she made sure that it was a mixed group of people. So whether you're a woman, um, yeah, um, you can you had sitting um religious needs or disability, you know, all those kind of correct um protective characteristics, social mobility, all of that in this group. So they were able to actually share their experiences and how they felt the organization could move forward. But also people who were privy to that information were hearing from other people's experiences. You know, so she refused, um, not refused, but she said it didn't make, make sense to have so many separate groups when we could have this blend club. And they met, I think it was, um, I think it was quarterly or, with, or anytime there was anything big happening, they would meet up and talk about it and break it down for senior managers and then put their findings towards the senior man, um, senior management team. So I thought that was a really interesting um, way of doing things. Um, so yeah, next slide. So I love this cat. <laughs> because I think, number one, I do like cats, but I prefer dogs. But um, such psychological safety is feeling like this cat. You know, it's coming into work, and work is your second home, and you're just like... I can be myself, you know, I, you know, the way I dress in when I was, when I first started working in the, in the corporate world, I wouldn't have my big earrings. I would never wear red lipstick. Um, now and again, I would change my hairstyle, but then I hated the comments because I just, I hated that kind of spotlight on me all the time. And from a simple conversation to, um, oh, I like your hair. It then became a whole discussion around, oh God, can't you grow your hair? How long is your hair? Oh, I, I know black, I, I know a black girl. She her hair doesn't grow that much. And then it was all these things that came with it. And um, people think, oh, it's just about hair, but no, it's it just then becomes an attack on your culture and who you are. And similar with religion as well. So to say, oh, I know a Muslim girl, and then literally it's like, oh my God, you're going to use that Muslim woman to, to, as an expert, you know, for all things Muslim. So psychological safety is all of it. It's creating a space where, you know, people do feel comfortable. People can be un unapologetically themselves, authentically themselves and looking at how, you know, how do you manage that? How do you create that safe space for them? Um, and equally, it could be neurodiverse as well. Is it neuro, is your, is your, are people who are neurodiverse, um, do they feel safe enough to talk about um, how they're feeling or how certain software is a bit too cloudy for them or, you know, so it's it's on all levels. Um, so, yeah, so these are some tips 
that I wanted to put forward. But again, it's communication, like Jade said before. It's not talk, it's not based on assumptions because you know your next door neighbor's um brother-in-law is black and you got your tips <laughs> from them, you know. So it's having conversations and having authentic conversations. So uh, you know, going back to um the Nguzi Fulani conversation at the um at Buckingham Palace this question of where you're from for some people who have never had that question before they thought oh it's just a, a you know it's a it's not why is it such a, a, a um a negative question but it's the intent behind it you know so a lot of us who come from um minoritized communities when companies do say do say they're putting positive action into place Sometimes you feel like it's a it's a burden. You are a burden on that on that organization. So it's the it's the authenticity behind the actions, the authenticity behind the questions. But we'll share this with you as well. Um, next slide. So yeah, I love this. Um, again, I'll share the link with you. So step one when we're looking at inclusion, safety, and um, I don't know whether it was Jade who mentioned it or it was in the video. I think it was Jade about inclusion first. You know, we talk about EDI, but actually, do your staff members feel included? Do you do you as a senior member of staff feel included? You know, when we used to talk about racism within the education system, and people say, "Yeah, but we've got one black teacher." But how can that black teacher try and support him, support black staff when she's? facing racism herself she's facing not getting promoted or getting developed um development opportunities so inclusion comes in so many different um coats and hats um stage two learner safety you know do people feel safe enough to say i don't know you know i don't get it um you know are they comfortable with making mistakes and and psychological safety is not about saying yes to everything you know, because that's not how the world works. But it's about understanding and making decisions based on knowledge and research. We all have access to the internet. We all have access to a library. We all have access, you know, to, to people. And as Jade said before, Black women, you know, studies have shown that Black women would do their research. So when people were asking me questions about, um, you know, what book should I read? I've had to do a lot of this research myself. You know, I've had to interview people myself. You know, I'm not saying everyone's got access to interviewing people, but we all have access to libraries and books and YouTube. And, you know, we can start making certain, making certain steps ourselves. So when you do come to someone like me, just out of, you know, an informal conversation, I want to feel that, you know, it's just not a cold email. You've actually done some homework behind it. Um, yeah, and then contributor safety and challenger safety as well. So those are the four stages. Um, and again, we'll share this. Yeah, next slide. And yes, yeah, so some personal actions. Um, what can you do right now without permission or support? What do you want to develop next? And how do you like to learn and develop? What can management do to enable or reinforce change? And what else needs to change? So these are questions that you know, I'd love for you to think about. Um, but also use, so I'm very open about, please feel free to steal anything that I've put, put on my slide to implement some kind of change and conversation. But it has to start with a conversation, but also has to start with a conversation with yourself as well. So ask yourself these questions. And a lot of you in Slido talked about um, um, the systems change, um, buying from leadership. Um, and if you are a leader, how can you make that environment safe enough for your for your team to come to you and, and, and with these questions of I do want to, de to develop. Can I is there space for me to develop? Um, uh, again, take that forward. So let me just double check before I move. Yeah, I'm loving this. Paul, thank you. Well, Sahana. So when in society did how will you become a greeting like hello rather than a genuine interest in another person? You know, it's funny, Paul. This is a real quick one. Um, I had a conversation on my radio show about, you know, those three words, are you okay? And a lot of us are never 
uh, are never ready for someone to say, no, I'm not. And I am one, one of those people because I'm so used to managing my emotions and managing my expectations that I assume that everyone is like me and Tim. If I say, are you okay? I expect you to say, yeah, of course, I'm great. And before lockdown, I remember I hadn't seen someone for a very long time. And it was someone that I used to work with. And I was like, oh, are you okay? Give it a big hug. And I said, how are you? And she said, I'm not okay. And I didn't know how to react with, I am not okay. And it was a learning curve for me to kind of re, you know, talk to myself and address why do I feel uncomfortable with people saying I am not okay and how do I manage that? So just those questions, you know, is something that we need to get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable and how do we manage something so simple as I am not okay? You know, so yeah, thank you. But I don't like realistically, I don't want this to end. <laughs> but Sharon has to. <laughs> Sharon, you can come in. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Good Anne, and and thank you, Jade. And we we have just in the in the final um few minutes, but just before I wrap up and and thank you both um formally um or, or officially um then I, I did just want to give people the opportunity if there are any specific questions that you'd like to put to Jade or Gunan from what you've heard this morning then we have got a couple of minutes so we can take a couple of questions um if, if there's anything I know we've had some great engagement as we've gone through uh which is fab uh, in the chat box but if anybody does want um you know any burning questions that you've got then please uh feel free to to just let us know um or pop them in the chat and we can we can put them to Gunan and, and Jade before we close um so even just opinions. sorry even opinions yeah yeah and anything at all any observations or reflections that you've got and and i think what's been really helpful is you've given us um both jade and gunan have given um some you know some prompts for questions to to go away and, and kind of think through do, you know do some reflections on what you've heard this morning what that means um and and kind of you know what you can do with it and again just looking uh, from hannah yeah not a question just just a bit authentic yeah thank you and i think that authenticity came through loud and clear didn't it um and i know a couple of people have had to leave um earlier on but put in the chat just to say thank you um to both jade and gunan for your, your um your input this morning um so uh, just whilst i'm giving you that time to, to think i suppose just a, a couple of my reflections on what we've heard this morning um i think there's there's something uh, on on different levels really so from a very um personal level uh one of the, the quotes that that somebody shared was um it's about caring enough to do something about it and i think that really resonated with me because i thought well you know we're all here this morning because we're clearly interested and going back to the first question you know how confident are we and how interested and i think you know there's lots of interest um, and hopefully from what we've heard this morning it's given us some more confidence around actually starting some of these conversations or continuing the conversations and doing that on a, on a as i say a personal level thinking about how, how do we support ourselves to feel less um uncomfortable and, and make that shift to more of that curiosity so we can ask the questions we can find out more um, and and really help to to drive some of that um inclusive culture in the workplace so i think there's a personal aspect but then very much that strategic aspect as well so for us as leaders um you know we have that role to play in in terms of setting setting the scene setting the tone for the organization and again um listening from um to, to what you've shared jade some real practical things there around holding the mirror up i think to you know certainly myself um as a senior leader in our organization and thinking how can we do um more and and how inclusive are we and really thinking about the impact and that you know so some really key messages there that i think have, have will have, have given lots of people food for thought uh, and again i'm just bear with me uh, i think there's some comments coming through in the chat yep yeah. um Big authenticity truly sharing cultures is the key and i think that that struck struck me as well it's it's moving away from that you know calendar of events or initiatives they're not one-off things that we you know it's inclusion week or whatever actually this is something around more sustainable um culture change that is really key to you know to, to making this stick and making it last really and then it's, it's kind of becomes what we do doesn't it um I was going to add one, um, so because we always talk about changing in our own little ways. So I present an African Caribbean show. I'm not from the LGBTQ community at all, um, but I do support them. And on my show, I decided to do a show um, at, 
every, I think it was every week I would interview someone from the LGBTQ community black who was black, you know, to highlight the intersectionalities and give them a platform. And it's things like that where you find different ways, but also subtle ways, not, not saying, you know, you've got to jump, jump in like that, but it's like, there's ways in which you don't know, you don't, it doesn't have to be like, this is my friend and they are gay. You know, it's just little ways of bringing those voices to the forefront, you know. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gunan. And Jade, would you like to come in just for a final, final word? Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to come in because I think someone put, David Brown put, I, I feel that truly sharing cultures is the key. And I think there's something so incredibly important about that. And one of the things I often say to people when I'm running DEI workshops is that we all have culture. Culture isn't something that just belongs to other people, to different groups. Every single one of us has a culture, the social lens which we view the world through. And I think it's really important that we get comfortable sharing cultures and recognizing that we are all a part of a culture, that we all come from different cultures and there are things, similarities and differences and things to be learned from each other in different ways. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think, you know, often people look to the organization um, to create the culture. And actually, we're, like you say, we're, we're all part of it. We all bring our own cultures. And actually, we're, we're very much the culture, aren't we? So um, I think that's, that's really important. Thank you. Um, I, just in the interest of time, I, I will draw us to a, a close now. Thank you so much to Gunan and Jade for your fabulous input and insights this morning. Really um, helped us. I think somebody said in the chat, it really helped to, you know, to start that conversation, start our thinking. Kim. So there's a couple of things just to wrap up um, to, to end the, the masterclass this morning. Um, we are always really keen to get your feedback and input from um, the session. So if I could invite you to um, complete the survey link, uh, we'll pop the link in the chat so you can click on that and um, either do that before you dash off to your next meeting or over lunch. Um, but at some point over the next day or so, if you could give us some feedback via that link, that would be fantastic. Thank you, because we're always keen to hear and we can share that with our speakers. But also, if there's anything about the format of the session, we can um, take that learning on board for our future sessions um, and speaking of which um, our next lineup for you uh, the date for our next session is Thursday the 9th of March and our next masterclass will be all around authentic and compassionate leadership um, and again we've put the link in the chat there so you can book on that um, and join us at our next one but it just remains for me to say a huge thank you once again to to Jade and Gunan for your um, preparation and your contributions this morning you've really been great and a real joy to listen to um, and, and get us thinking. So on behalf of the Collaborative Masterclass and all of the partners, thank you so much for, for, um, for your input. And to everybody else, thank you so much for joining us for your comments and contributions in the chat. It's felt really interactive and those, you know, two and a half hours have flown by, um, which I think is always a great sign. So, uh, so thank you so much. And we look forward to welcoming you back at the next one. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And uh, give some give some thought to what you're going to do to, um, as I say, care enough to do something about it. So what is it that we can all take away and do? Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.